Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Bob Fern. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health. I've got a very simple job this evening, which is simply to welcome you, um, to congratulate Rob on, on his achievement. Um, becoming a, a professor is an important event in the life of an academic. Um, and we, tonight we celebrate Rob's, Rob's achievement in, in making that milestone. Um, it's a long tradition that a newly minted professor um, should give a talk to profess their expertise to a general audience such as uh, that gathered here tonight. So I'm just going to pass you over now to Ewan McCall, head of the um, Peninsula Dental School, who will give a, a more personal introduction. Thank you very much. So um, it definitely is a personal introduction because I first met Rob in 1999 as he was a newly commissioned officer in the Royal Army Dental Corps. So hence the core to community. So I'm sure Rob will expand on it. So uh, Rob was commissioned into the Royal Ar Army Dental Corps. The commission as then came from Queen Elizabeth II. He would have got a nice commissioning sc scroll and he then joined the dental corps. So I met him as a fresh faced uh, captain and look at him now. Um, so um, at that time, Rob qualified from Birmingham. I do have Rob's CV here. So if I were to read this out, that would probably take up all the time. So he has a huge, so it's been quite a sort of, every day is a learning day and it's been quite interesting to see Rob's many achievements. I knew lots of them already, but reading through the CV is uh, uh, very, very impressive. Um, in Rob's journey. Um, and core to community highlights very much Rob's journey. So uh, I became aware of Rob and followed his career in the military. I was then, I moved on to be a Lieutenant Colonel and Rob moved very, very rapidly through the military. So um, his career profile in the, in the military, he was, he was definitely a rising star. In the military, he had two operational tours very early on. So he deployed to Northern Ireland to one of the uh, more outlying areas of Northern Ireland and Oma. And then he also went to Kosovo with one close support medical squadron. So doing a lot of the uh, medical cover for troops in Kosovo. Um, and this was in quite a short time period that Rob had actually, um, so that was 99, um, moved on. He did two operational tours. Um, he served in Cyprus also. Uh, Cyprus, he undertook a lot of skydiving. Um, diving also, so um, as well as moving to Cyprus with his family. So he packed a lot in, and I remember at the time there were a group of about six or seven, Rob would have been a major by then, who were seen as rising stars. So it was a bit of a surprise, I think, when Rob left the military, um, particularly to the military hierarchy, that this rising star had left. And what did Rob leave to do? He went to the University of Portsmouth. So what a come down. I'm only joking if you're, if you're from Portsmouth. Um, I'm only joking, it's fantastic. And Rob worked there. He, he also has his PhD from the University of Portsmouth, which I guess he will cover in the, uh, this evening. The PhD was around oral health, in, inequal, uh, oral health inequalities in socially excluded groups. And that's certainly been the theme of Rob's career. So he finished at the University of Portsmouth and he moved to... Um, another mouth in that he moved to Plymouth, so easily to confuse the two. And Rob was a pioneer in many respects, you know, a pioneer in the military and uh, going on operational tours so early. Um, and he was a pioneer at Plymouth because he arrived in Plymouth, um, that would have been uh, 2008, and he started specialist training in dental public health. And at that time, it was a very, very new school. I think Rob would be the first consultant that they actually trained. So it was certainly a pioneering move for Rob to, to join the dental school, as was then, and to undergo um, a specialist training in dental public health. And also quite risky in many respects. You know, it wasn't a tried and tested route. Um, big uh, high stakes exams, which Rob passed first time, which was, was in, indeed a challenge to become a consultant in public health. So quite an achievement in a new environment to take that bold step. Um, and maybe many of those elements he learned from his military career that transferred um, from core to community to seize these opportunities. 
Rob then um, very, very quickly, given that he was a new consultant, um, he then was involved in the formation of Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise. And I'm sure as Rob uh, will discuss, Rob pretty much arrived uh, the inception of Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise. There was really nothing there. Rob was responsible for all the uh, policies, all the transferring of staff, all the legalities around that, which for again, for a newly qualified consultant was a massive step up. So Rob pretty much set uh, Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise on the pathway to success and in due course became the chief executive of Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise. Now, when you look at his CV, and I'm sure Rob, uh, being a team player, wouldn't take credit for it, but the myriad achievements of social enterprise, uh, Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise, under Rob's leadership um, is two pages. Um, so that's great testament to Rob, his commitment to uh, community dentistry. And if you look, so if just for example, winner of the Best Children's Care Award at the National Oral Health Awards, winner of the Business Diversification Award for PDSE, Devon Chamber of Commerce, winner of Best Care of Vulnerable Patients, which ties in with Rob's PhD, winner of Social Enterprise category, Social Enterprise of the Year, and on it goes, culminating in, I would say, is the university, much of um, the work that Rob initiated, uh, of course, a team game, went on last year to win the Times Higher Education Award, which is the ultimate accolade in higher education. So the Rob's work that he led in the community, and of course, it's a team game, um, coupling community care to our patients, to student education. So Rob, Rob was... Um, many of the ideas which you'll talk about in his talk came from Rob. So as he moved on, um, he got more and more leadership experience. He spent time at Harvard University in the Senior Dental Leadership Program. Um, he's involved in, which many of us probably don't know because we see him around day to day and we think um, he's just Rob. Uh, but he's also advised uh, the World Dental Federation, FDI, is an expert working group on oral health. And He's probably one of the high, if you don't know much about dentistry, he's one of the highest profile uh, consultants in dental public health in the UK. So involved in the BDA, we kind of maybe in our Plymouth world um, here to some extent, but Rob is one of, one of the most high profile, mainly for his work with um, community groups, uh, patients that struggle to find access. And as you're aware, all patients struggled to find access, particularly in the southwest, um, across the country. Rob particularly um, focuses a lot of work in groups that really, really find it a challenge to um, access uh, this type of care. So I think Rob's Rob's career and um, his journey has certainly been from core to community. I'm sure having served in RADC, the dental corps, a lot of the messages, the leadership, um, the looking out for other team members has transferred into his work in the community. So I look forward to uh, hearing about the journey in a bit more detail, Rob. So over to you. Great, thank you very much, Ewan. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that introduction, Ewan. I was sat there thinking, is that really me? But thank you, it must be. Um, thank you ever so much for coming out this evening. I appreciate it's a very dark, dreary February night. It's so nice to see so many of you here in person and also people online as well. I do really appreciate it. So this is my talk. Um, Ewan's already explained a little bit about my background. So from core to community, making the case for oral health. So I thought I'd better start at the very beginning. So this is where I was born. This is a little village in the West Midlands called Wordsley. It's famous for a few things. Uh, pubs being one of the most important, lots of pubs there. And it's also famous for canals, which I'll come on to in a moment, and also cut glass. So if any of you have ever bought any cut glass or know anything about cut glass, it's a very famous centre. And there's a very nice glass museum in Worthley if anyone would like to visit. So um, this is the black country. So this is where uh, I'm from. It's part of the West Midlands. And we need to clear something up very quickly in the presentation today. This is mostly for Nathan's benefit. The black country is not Birmingham, and I'm not a Brummie. Uh, despite the fact I get called a Brummie very often. Um, the Black Country is this area out here, and I grew up just on the border, really, with Worcestershire and Staffordshire. 
we have our own flag, which you can see is chain mail. And the reason for that is it was called the Black Country because there was so much heavy industry at the time. And really the Black Country, although it's uh, the butt of many jokes, it actually was the engine house of the Industrial Re Revolution. And you can find ironworks that were produced in the Black Country pretty much across the world and had a very significant role in development of the Royal Navy back, back uh, in the late 1900s. So as Ewan said, um, I didn't fall far from the nest. Um, so growing up in the back country, I decided to go to the University of Birmingham. If anyone uh, has been to the campus there, it's a beautiful red brick campus. This is Chamberlain Hall, and this is the uh, hall that I graduated from. It was a very wonderful occasion. And uh, I spent my first two years here. So this is where all your preclinical academic training took place. And then I transferred to the dental hospital and this is the old dental hospital in the city centre of Birmingham. Um, it's since relocated to a, a leafy area of, of Edgbaston. But I really enjoyed my time here. I was on floor five uh, and I'm still in contact with many of the people I graduated with. I had a thoroughly wonderful time. But at that point, I thought it's really time to get away from the Midlands. So as you mentioned, I joined the army and I served for eight years in the dental corps. This is me on a very early training exercise, looking very fresh-faced and enthusiastic. Uh, and I uh, was very fortunate to work in a number of different countries around the world. Uh, you will recognise some of the faces in this picture. This is Kosovo. Uh, this is myself and my uh, 2IC. Uh, and I'll talk about what our role was in a moment. This is in Malaysia. I was lucky enough to do an exchange with the Malaysian Armed Forces for a few months, which was also a really great experience. I put this picture in, this is me, so uh, me as a young army dentist. And I put this picture in in particular because this soldier is responsible for my very first publication. And he came and sat in my chair. He'd only recently just joined the army and been through basic training and was posted out to Kosovo. And he was complaining of a, a small mark on his cheek. And um, he'd been to see the GP prior to joining the army. The GP thought it was infected acne and was prescribing him anti antibiotics and those courses of antibiotics were continuing but the GP never asked the patient if he had any pain from his mouth and that little skin lesion on the side of his cheek was an all anchor fistula which the dentists in the room will know is due to chronic long-standing infection so simply taking out the tooth removed that infection and he ended up with a little scar unfortunately because it had obviously penetrated the external skin but I wrote that up as a case study for dental update and that's a a journal that most of the dentists will know, and that was, I think, in 2002. And that sort of really sparked my interest in sort of uh, academia and talking about dentistry and communicating about the things that we do. So just to give you some idea of what army life is like as a dentist, this is Kosovo. So this picture at the top uh, left-hand side here, this is the, uh, it was called MR, MRS Harden Lines, and this was effectively the field hospital in Kosovo at the time. So this tent here at the very top right hand side was the dental centre. Uh, this was the community psychiatric nurse and sexual health. These were the operating theatres. This was uh, triage or the emergency department. And at the very end of this was the helicopter pad where casualties were brought in. So they were triaged here. If needed surgery, they moved into surgery or they moved onto the ward, which was here. So it was a great experience. You know, being a dentist um, in the military is is great for two reasons. One, that uh, they have very high clinical standards and they all support your career. But the other one is you get to do all these amazing things, uh, much broader than just dentistry. If I had an opportunity, I always like to go out on patrol with the soldiers because it was really good fun. So this is the northern Kosovo border. This is Serbia in the distance. And those patrols were really mostly to stop um, gun smuggling across the border into Kos Kosovo. So it was a really interesting time. This picture, is, is one really that I can attribute to my interest in public health and community engagement and working with communities. So this is a, a Remi soldier, Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineer, and he's actually um, instructing the local community on how to repair this Land Rover. What you tend to find in war zones and areas of conflict, lots of aid floods in, but actually no one asks the local community what they actually need. And so, um, the community ended up with a right-hand uh, drive Land Rover, despite the fact they drive on the left. Uh, Land Rovers are very, uh, are very rare in Kosovo, so there was no supply chain for spare parts and no expertise in how, in, in how to maintain them. And that really got me thinking about actually, 
if we're going to help people, we need to ask them first what they need. And that sort of stayed with me throughout the rest of my military career. As you mentioned, I then moved on to Portsmouth Dental Academy, and I've had an ongoing relationship with Portsmouth for quite a while now. Um, in some ways, very much similar to, to Plymouth as a city, um, quite significant oral health inequalities. And one of my roles at Portsmouth was to help to develop an NHS dental service in the school, uh, which would act as a feed for student clinics for patients. And we also uh, did some outreach work. And that was really where my sort of interest in outreach and community engagement really started to, to, to come to the fore. I had a really wonderful time there, but there was an opportunity to come moved to Plymouth to do my specialty training in dental public health. And as Ewan said, I arrived in 2008, and those first four years I was doing my specialty training in dental public health embedded into the dental school. And I was the first specialty trainee uh, here at, at Plymouth, so in some ways uh, stress tested all the, all, the, uh, <laughs> all the opportunities that Peninsula had to offer. And I've been at the dental school ever since. So when I completed my specialty training, I passed my consultant exams, I was lucky enough to apply for a job and be successful and I'm still here today as the academic lead for community dentistry and dental public health. As you mentioned, um, part of that journey has involved developing this organisation which is called Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise and it is a, an organisation which operates the four clinical teaching facilities on behalf of the dental school. So I'm actually not going to talk too much about Peninsula Dental Social Enterprise today but we have a great website if you want to learn more about us. So before we move much further into the, into the meat of the presentation, I've got a, a couple of special thank yous because as anyone knows who works in the community, it's almost impossible to do that on your own. You need a team of people around you to, to support um, those activities. And these two people in particular are my longest serving collaborators. So um, Rob Nelzer is a consultant uh, in public health at Plymouth City Council. In fact, I sat next to Rob when I arrived in 2008 for part of the week. Um, he was one of my consultant trainers and we've worked together ever since. And we've done a lot of work in the city in that time over the past 14 or so years, particularly making the case for oral health and raising that up the political agenda in, in Plymouth. And then secondly, uh, Martha, I think she's listening online, um, is uh, the research lead in PDSE and a senior research fellow in the Faculty of Health. Uh, her and I both share uh, an interest in addressing oral health needs in socially excluded groups. We're very much a team and uh, we complement each other very well in terms of our, our skill set and I really couldn't be here without both Rob and Martha and a wider team of people who I wanted to thank. Lindsay's in the audience, thank you Lindsay for coming along tonight. Um, when you work in the community, although uh, on the surface it might seem very simple, it's actually incredibly challenging at times and you need a whole host of people to, to help support that. So some of these individuals, um, Zoe and Rena, are consultants that I've trained. Uh, my latest trainee is Joelle and I've got Afsha as well. Uh, Anastasios is here, who's a wonderful uh, dentist and PhD student, is doing some work evaluating our uh, community outreach via students. So all of these people bring together um, a whole bunch of expertise that actually I rely on to do my work. So I'm very grateful and thank you for your supporting me. So we're going to move on to why do we need to make the case for oral health? Well, we need to make the case because uh, oral health and uh, oral diseases are the most common diseases to affect the population and the global population. 3.5 billion people are affected by poor oral health in the world. Dental decay is the most common dental, so it's the most common disease in the global burden of disease study. And that's quite a shocking statistic if you think about it, because this is a condition which is entirely preventable with um, the right home measures. It's also costly to treat, not just to the individual, who more often than not has to make out-of-pocket payments, but also to governments and society as a whole. Uh, treating dental dise diseases is actually more expensive than treating cancer and obesity combined. So... Uh, a very serious disease, a very serious public health problem, but one that attracts very little attention. It's relatively neglected in healthcare policy, uh, not just in the UK, but in, in many countries. And uh, political neglect, and I'm sure you have mentioned access to dentistry is very difficult. Without that political prioritisation, unfortunately, oral health will continue to be treated in the same way. 
Addressing oral health also relies on addressing the root causes of poor health, and many of those uh, are structural. So um, one of the biggest impacts and influences on our, on our health overall is the wider society and social, economic and environmental factors. So those factors shape our health outcomes much more so than our access to health services. And this is something we speak to dental students quite a lot about. Dental services alone cannot address the burden of oral health in society and it can't address oral health inequalities either. We do need uh, an action. In public health, we call it upstream or midstream actions to focus on those wider structural determinants. We know that the healthier we are, the healthier our society, uh, the healthier that we will live. And that's really important and something that actually the students struggle to get their head around sometimes. Um, as you can see down here, healthcare services only contribute about 20% to our overall health outcomes. And you have to remember that there are many groups in society who can't access services anyway. So it has a relatively small impact on our overall health and health outcomes. Addressing oral health requires that public health lens. So it's thinking not just about dental services, but also about uh, all of these other actions, uh, addressing these factors. Uh, we know that our health behaviours are very much shaped by our environment and by the structural determinants of health. And I'm sure this diagram will be updated in, uh, shortly to include also the commercial determinants of health. Those factors that we're bombarded with all the time that influence our choices around food, uh, drinks, you know, our lifestyle um, uh, behaviours and habits. So my work is very much focused around trying to take uh, a more public health approach to addressing some of these oral health challenges and in an, in an effort to reduce oral health inequalities. So I thought I'd just run through some oral health data, uh, well, some health data initially, and then some oral health data. And I'm gonna zoom in sort of national, regional, and then local to give you a Plymouth flavor to some of this uh, data. So don't worry too much about the scales on these graphs. They're all different, different scales. The thing that I'm, I'm hoping you're gonna pick out is the actual uh, similar patterns among all of these graphs. So on the top left-hand side, you can see that graph is preventable mortality. And the left-hand side of the graph is the most deprived decile group, and on the right-hand side, it's the least deprived decile group. And you can see full preventable uh, mortality due to cardiovascular disease or to cancer, it's the same pattern. It's also the same pattern for childhood obesity uh, and overweight, and the same pattern for dental decay. So in other words, these health inequalities cluster together. So people who have poor health have poor oral health. And one thing you notice on these graphs is that the steepest slope is for dental decay. The most serious inequalities occur in oral health. I've chosen oral cancer in this, uh, in this slide. It's probably the most serious disease that we, we encounter and manage as dental professionals. And you can see the same pattern here. So this is the most deprived group and the least deprived group on the right hand side. And you can see there's also almost a, a twofold difference in mortality outcomes between those groups for oral cancer. Moving on to a southwest example now, this is the proportion of children who have uh, what's called dentinal decay. Dentinal decay is decay that's progressed into the dentine of the tooth and it most, in most cases requires treatment. So it's something that needs an intervention. And you can see here the bottom line is the least deprived decile. The top line is the, sorry, um, the most deprived decile. And what you can see here is in the least deprived decile from 2008 to 2022, there's generally speaking a downward trajectory. So actually in the least deprived children, they're getting better every single uh, time this survey is conducted. However, if you look at the most deprived decile, you can see it slightly jumped between 2008 and 2012. And actually it's sort of bimbling along. There isn't a downward trajectory. And in fact, it's, there's a slight upturn between 2019 and 2022. So those inequalities are actually widening in children age five. Anyone want to hazard a guess why they think there was a little bump here between 2008 and 2012? It gives me a chance to have a little sip of water as well. Any ideas? Yeah, good. Who said that? I know you get that, Safia. Yeah. So if you remember, there was a quite a severe recession in, in the UK in 2009, and it took a number of years to, to emerge from that. And what we know is that when 
When people's lives suffer, so does their oral health. So poverty is so inextricably linked to, uh, to oral health outcomes. We know when people are poorer, their oral health is poorer. And, you, and I think that may be the reason why we've seen a slight increase here as well, because if you remember, sort of co the COVID years, emerging from COVID, we hit a bit of a bump as well in the economy. So I'm going to zoom in now on a Plymouth example. So this is a, a map of Plymouth, and uh, you can see all the different uh, neighbourhoods in Plymouth. This is a map of general anaesthesia. So these are children who are referred to hospital to have teeth taken out. So it's the most severe form of den uh, dental decay. Um, often children go and have multiple teeth extracted. And for those of you who know Plymouth well, you can see this sort of concentric C-shape towards the left-hand side of the city. And these are the more deprived areas. And you can see the red hotspots and the orange hotspots. I think this is probably a data blip because we've been monitoring this for about a decade now. And these areas are consistently the same. Of course, if I overlaid a map of CVD mortality or, or, or cancer in Plymouth, it would be exactly the same pattern. So giving you that sense of actually uh, addressing poverty and these wider structural factors that influence our health is so important. And of course, we have to remember all of this in, against, the, the con, against the context of a, of a rapidly changing population profile. So um, you'll see on this, on this, on this graphic here, uh, we're expecting a slight growth in uh, adult working age uh, individuals, uh, a very small, very small increase. But actually, the biggest growth is in the um, older and elder, elder population. And that's going to grow quite substantially over the next decade. If you project that forwards 30 years, it's projected that uh, one in five people over the age will be over the age of 65 in the population. So we're undergoing a, a significant population profile shift uh, in the UK. I'm not going to talk about older person's dental care or gerodontology today, but it's actually a problem that's, that's going to really come upon us quite quickly. We are really woefully underprepared in the UK to how to manage that, that scenario. And I think we'll need to look to nations like Japan and other countries similar to those who've actually undergone that profile change already to see how they are managing that. So it's not all gloomy. There are some things we can do to address um, oral health inequalities. These are some re evidence-based uh, recommendations from Public Health England and NICE. And they're actually quite simple, or they sound simple on the face of it. So ensuring oral health is a key health and wellbeing priority. I think we'd all agree with that. It has to be in all policies. And at the moment, it mostly sits in dental policies. Uh, but we need to broaden that out to all health policies. Uh, action to improve the wider determinants of health. I've given some sort of dental examples there, but there's a lot that could fall under that. We love a bit of, we love a bit of fluoride in dentistry and we like giving it out. And there's a lot of good evidence for, uh, for fluoride. And I'm going to talk about supervised toothbrushing schemes a little bit later in my presentation because they're quite topical, topical up at the moment. Training the education, health and social care workforce. A dentist can't be on every street corner or in every kind of community setting, so we need to train other people to be our advocates and to pass on our messages for us and support individuals and communities. And establishing equitable and timely access to dental care. And I'm going to talk about that really through the lens of socially excluded groups and more vulnerable groups, because that's where my interest lies. And importantly, and as Lindsay will know, it's really important when you do try to uh, address oral health inequalities in socially excluded groups that you do that with them and not to them. And uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about some examples of how we do that um, in a moment. So Ewan's mentioned the dental school and um, I was really keen to come to the dental school because I developed this interest in community and oral health inequalities. I'd had some exposure to it at Portsmouth University, um, but I was really keen to come here. So when I saw a job advertised for a trainee in dental public health, I, I, I grabbed the chance. And the reason for that is, um, the dental school was set up very differently to how other dental schools are. So in most other parts of the country, dental schools are associated with a hospital. It's very different here. We have our four facilities embedded in local communities across Devon and Cornwall. And it was very much set up as a dental school for the community it serves. And that really appealed to me. And I thought, what a great place to do my dental public health training, to come to a dental school that actually is um, promoting those values and that kind of concept and philosophy. And uh, PDS in the early days was very much based around these three things, professionalism, dental school, dental skills rather, and societal. And actually that societal part was actually quite radical at the time. 
And I don't think people were thinking in that way when the dental school was established. And I'm pretty sure it was probably the reason why the, the bid at Plymouth was successful, because it brought a new way of thinking to how we could educate dental students, but also serve our local communities. And we do a lot of work in the curriculum to, um, work to encourage our students to be socially responsible. Of course, the challenge is when they leave the, de the dental school, then they have to work in an NHS system that actually probably uh, harms that, that sense of social responsibility and wanting to do good for local communities because of the way the contract um, operates. So that's the dental school and why I wanted to come. And we've developed this community approach and Ewan touched on it in, in his intro. So for the academics in the room, the, the theory is on the left hand side and the practice for the, is on the right hand side. So we've developed this community approach, which is a core, core component of our, of our curriculum and our clinical training in, in the dental school. And in order to do that, we have a dedicated outreach team. And we're really lucky to have one of those. I think we are the only dental school in the country to have one. And that's been a constant thread throughout the various iterations of the dental school, um, sort of looking back to when it was formed in 2007. And to enable this community approach to take place, to, occur, to happen, We've developed academic community partnerships with a whole range of local organisations. And I think at any one time we have about 30 or 40 organisations that we work with, that we work with through students, and we also work with directly. And that acts as a, a really excellent vehicle for educating students about local communities, uh, their priorities, their needs, but it also enables us to deliver a degree of service back to the community. So um, we've developed a whole range of projects often starting with students and then developed thereafter by academics and some of my colleagues in PDSE. And I'll talk about some of those illustrative examples in a moment. Dental schools are also under a little bit of pressure at the moment. So we, we have a regulator called the General Dental Council. And I think there's a feeling that dental education has actually separated to some degree from the priority needs of communities. So we have some new learning outcomes in the GDC Safe Practitioner framework around social responsibility. And you know, part of, our, part of our role in the school is to respond to that. And I think we're in a really good place because I think we're probably one of the most advanced dental schools in thinking around community and social responsibility and how we can align our curricula to our local community needs, how we can work in genuine partnership with communities and how we can promote health and health equity. And I think we do a fantastic job of that here at Peninsula. So how do we do that with students? So we've developed this concept of community classrooms. So we partner student groups um, together with local community organisations to create a community classroom. And our students work out in the community with that organisation over two terms in year two. And they also do some early engagement work in year one as well. And there's nothing better than taking students out into the community for uh, developing their uh, awareness, knowledge, understanding of how people live in local communities, what some of their challenges are, how they access services, what type of services would they like to access. Um, it's a really uh, authentic and uh, a really effective way of teaching students about oral health inequalities and dental public health. When I was a student, my dental public health teaching was a series of lectures, cellophanes back then, if you remember, if you're old enough, on the overhead projector. And it all seemed very dull and uh, boring to me. And I didn't go to many of my lectures in dental public health, I've got to be honest. Uh, but this is a really great way of actually bringing it to life for the students and actually grounding them in what it means to be a dental professional. So that's how, uh, so that's how we do it. And we're very grateful to all our community partners who help support this. We couldn't do it without them. Um, and the students, um, I'll be honest, are sometimes a little bit scared at the beginning when we start introducing this in the workshop to them. Um, for many of them, it's, it's an opportunity to work with people who they've uh, never met before from very different backgrounds. Uh, and to be honest, we intentionally challenge the students. Um, we want them to go out there and to explore that community group um, using their sort of skills that they've developed early on in, in, their, in their training around sort of searching the evidence, how to, um, how to explore organisations. And if I'm honest, it's, it's probably the most rewarding part of my job because when I see students at the very start of, the, of this module, and there's some some graduate students in the in the audience um, you know they are quite they are quite uh, nervous they're quite apprehensive it's something they've never done before it's taken them out of their comfort zone 
but actually at the end of it, and when we have a, a, a symposium at the end of the year, I can see how much they've developed in that time and how much they've developed those skills which are actually quite difficult to teach in the classroom. Things like leadership, communication skills, advocacy. Um, it gives them a real opportunity to test those skills out um, in the real world. And we've, we've spent a lot of time over the years, and Kathy's in the audience, we've done some work together um, with, a, with a student group, um, encouraging our students to write up about their experiences because we think it works. And um, we've um, published a, quite a bit of work on this, and this is just a small selection. There's uh, other colleagues in the dental school who've also published work um, from students. So we know it works from their perspective. What we're not quite sure on is how much it works for our local communities and how much it improves them as a dentist. And we're doing some work through Anastasios and his PhD, looking at that a bit more formally now through a, through a PhD uh, project. So we hope to report back on that um, soon. So all of that, that work so, sort, of, sort of distills down to three main things that we think it helps students with. Teamworking and their, their professional role and identity, communication, and the art of active listening. It's very easy uh, in the clinic for students to communicate with uh, patients, but that's a very unequal power balance. So when patients come in, they are, uh, in, in their eyes, seeing a, a dental professional. Um, that's a very different power balance to when students are out in the community talking to people firsthand. So that's really good at sort of equalizing those power relationships. Um, empathy and respect, something that is really, really important to be a healthcare professional. And I'm sure most of you in the audience would want your dentist to have most of these skills. Building trust and relationships, um, also one that is very, very important. So I'm going to start moving away now and talking about some of the projects. The students are fantastic because through these projects in the community, they can often identify uh, a whole range of things, sometimes gaps in knowledge, gaps in service provision, uh, gaps in our understanding, and, and sometimes they develop projects which have got real potential for further development and scalability. And so I'm in a really privileged position that we can actually start uh, developing some of those projects further with some academic expertise and seeing how we can develop and support those communities thereafter. And that's really important because for those of you who know a little bit about the, uh, the literature in terms of community participation and engagement, we have to avoid this issue of what's called empty ritual. So just using the community for education purposes, just using it for, to benefit our students. It has to be a more two-way relationship. And by having a dental outreach team that can further develop projects, that's a way of us providing continuous support to these community organisations all year round. So I'm going to start talking about some of the, uh, the projects that I've been involved in and, and, and developed. Um, I was going to start with improving children's oral health. You saw some of the data earlier that we don't have good oral health in some of our child populations. And it might surprise you to hear that um, the UK came last in a global survey uh, a few years ago on the uh, delivery of oral health education in schools, which is quite shocking, really. Um, there were many middle and low-income countries performing much better than the UK. And I don't know how much you know about this, but prior to this release of this document, which was in 2020, there was no formal guidance to teachers and education settings on uh, what should be taught in schools regarding oral health. Children learnt about teeth, they learnt about different types of teeth, the anatomy of teeth, you know, crocodile teeth tear, cows, have ru cows are ruminants and they chew, um, but they didn't learn anything about looking after their own teeth, the importance of toothbrushing, fluoride, sugar, and all of those things. That only came in in 2020, which is kind of shocking, really. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have the early years framework. So this guidance on the right-hand side is for primary and secondary schools, and the guidance released uh, even more recently than 2020, is the early years framework. And this guides early year settings and education settings in delivering oral health education as part of school, uh, part of school life, the fabric of school life and the school curriculum. And we know that that does work. And there's very clear guidance from the WHO on, on, healthy, on healthy schools, and they've developed a healthy schools framework. So we wanted to see if we could help local schools and, uh, and early year settings um, with their uh, responsibilities regarding oral health. But before I talk about some of those uh, examples, I want to talk about a, a project that starts right from birth called First Dental Steps. 
So this is a project um, that we've developed through our dental public health team in, in the Southwest. And I have to give credit to my consultant colleague, Rena, who um, led a lot of this um, when she was my trainee and she's continuing to lead on uh, now she's a, a consultant. And the idea behind this programme is to work with the public health workforce, so health visitors and early years workers, to, to implement an oral health intervention into the Healthy Child programme. And if you've not heard of the Healthy Child, Child programme before, it's a government scheme, it's government funded, and it's delivered by uh, health visitors to uh, carry out health checks for children, but in particular to identify children who might be at risk, either from, for safeguarding reasons or for, for, for whatever. So this scheme's been running for a little while, but it actually it didn't include anything about oral health. Uh, we've done some work through students um, over a number of years, um, working with the, the children's red book. I don't know if you know what the red book is, so for children who are born, they have a little red book and it contains details about growth, development, all of those sorts of things. That also didn't include oral health for a little while, and that's now being incorporated. But what this is really about is trying to identify children at risk in that age category 0 to 2. And the reason why that's important is that we know that most children in that age category don't visit a dentist, despite the guidance um, to parents that as soon as a baby tooth erupts, you should take your child to the dentist. In the southwest. The figures haven't been collated since COVID, but during uh, slightly, slightly prior to COVID, only about 17% of 0 to two year olds actually visit a dentist in the Southwest. So very low and actually some of the lowest figures in, in the country. So trying to get children off to the best start in life is really, really important. So uh, we developed this intervention called First Dental Steps. It involves training health visitors to give out key oral health messages, how to signpost to dental services, uh, we also provide a, an oral health pack, which includes a toothbrush, uh, fluoride appropriate toothpaste for those children, depending on their risk status, uh, a free flow cup, because we're trying to avoid these issues, which is called early childhood caries, due to children uh, drinking sugar drinks out of a, of a bottle, for example. And we want children like this. So we, we were successful obtaining some funding from the NHS and we developed six pilot sites in the local authority to implement this intervention. We set out to train 500 uh, health visitors and um, we did okay. We ended up training 453. Um, in terms of impacts, the pilot distributed 4,000 oral health packs. So that's 4,000 children benefiting from the intervention. And we also developed a referral pathway. We knew that access to dental care is very challenged in the Southwest and many of the health visitors work with children uh, who are particularly vulnerable. So we've developed a, a care pathway into local community dental services for these vulnerable children so they can get in uh, and, and have a dental assessment and a, and a proper risk assessment. So um, it's been rolling for a few years now. We did have, unfortunately, COVID gets in the way of everything. We did have to pause the intervention through, through COVID, but it's back up and running now. And uh, we were successful applying for some funding to NIHR to carry out a programme um, grant evaluation um, and that uh, we're just working on that now we've done a little bit of work on that al already but we know the intervention is, is certainly acceptable there was really good feedback on the intervention from both the health visitors and the early years workers from parents and from commissioners which is actually quite unusual and it and it is feasible to deliver so we're currently writing up the final paper on, on that intervention and uh, my colleague Rena wrote a successful business case to the NHS in the Southwest, and that is now going to be rolled out across all 15 local authorities. So there's a potential to impact upon you know, 50,000 children who are actually the most vulnerable children who are identified by health visitors. So that's one of the programmes. And the, uh, coming back to schools, so we've been working in schools for a number of years with our students and um, Teachers were really keen on incorporating oral health into the curriculum. We knew the guidance was coming along, but actually they just didn't know how to do it. So they said to us, so um, they asked us, could we help them in how to deliver oral health in a really fun and engaging way? So we developed this programme called um, Open Wide and Step Inside, and we, had, we successfully applied for industry funding for this programme. We had three successive grants in PDSE to help develop Open Wide and Step Inside. And this is a, an oral health education program which uh, uh, provides uh, resources and uh, toolkits to teachers to enable them to integrate oral health into curriculum delivery at key stage one. 
And that's not just in the health space, that's also in literacy and numeracy. And we had a whole range of partners we worked with on this, on this programme. We worked with educational um, advisors in the local authority to ensure that those, those, uh, that guidance and those toolkits were appropriate for, for teaching. We developed an animation, and you can see uh, Abby, one of our community engagement officers, uh, delivering the programme in one of the local schools. And this was, we developed this iteratively over, uh, over quite a long period of time now, since about 2014. And it's been delivered to over 15,000 children. We are commissioned to deliver this in Plymouth schools, and we target those schools uh, where we know children suffer from uh, poor oral health. It's got a multiple platform of resources. So there are also reading books, there are brushing charts, there are ch child resources, and each child gets a workbook that they can work through at school. We've done some evaluation on this, and it's, it's, it works. So um, I think it works partly because of the characters, because the, 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 the children remember the characters. Um, and uh, we did a really nice project actually just last year with the Theatre Royal. They were rolling out their reading project. So for those of you who are from Plymouth, um, there was a, a programme to encourage reading uh, in schools. And we were able to integrate our book in, into that programme. And uh, the actors from Theatre Royal went around all the Plymouth schools reading these stories and our book was included in that. And through that, we handed out over 2,000 books as well. So I thought it was a bit of fun. Um, you might want to see a little bit of the video. So you have to put yourself back to being a four or five year old, if that's possible. And uh, this tells you the story of Geoffrey. Welcome to the town of Toothypeg. It's a friendly place full of all sorts of people who all have one thing in common. None of them have ever had a toothache, or even a filling. Unfortunately, I do have to tell you, there is one person in Toothy Peg who thinks looking after his teeth is, well, boring. Looking after my teeth is well boring. His name is Geoffrey, and he's about to find himself with a giant problem. What on earth is the matter? My tooth! My tooth! It hurts! When did you last go to see Daisy the dentist? Uh, I ain't never seen a dentist. You've never been to the dentist? Cheesy crumbs, Geoffrey. Let's go! Will Geoffrey learn his lesson? Will they make it to the dentist before Geoffrey's tooth falls out? Join Geoffrey the Giant, Millie the Mouse, and a whole cast of toothy peggers as we set out to learn about taking care of your teeth. There are songs to sing, classroom quizzes to take, and a whole range of activities to explore. Learning has never been so much fun. So open wide and let's step inside. So that's the video. So I, it's actually 15 minutes in length. I thought I would spare you the, spare you the full, the full uh, video. Uh, and that's delivered across um, Plymouth schools. We've recently been commissioned to deliver this also in Tor Bay uh, and also in parts of Cornwall. So we're hoping we can keep on expanding that, that programme. Like I said, we've got really good evidence that it works and the children do retain the key oral health messages. It also supports some other programmes that go on in the southwest. So the video contains um, an illustration of an animal having their teeth painted with fluoride varnish, which is one of the other programmes that is commissioned in Plymouth, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but it just uh, all ties in really quite nicely. So um, moving on from oral health education, I thought I would talk a little bit about supervised toothbrushing, particularly because it's quite topical at the moment. And for those of you who follow politics, uh, the Labour Party have included supervised toothbrushing, a national scheme in their party manifesto for dentistry. And it was quite surprising seeing some of the reaction to that. And I've pulled out some of the, some of the news pieces um, uh, here. You can see uh, accusations of uh, calling the party a, a nanny state. You know, teachers are not there to brush children's teeth. I think that's some kind of misunderstanding about what the programme actually is. 
it's not the taxpayer's responsibility to make sure someone else's uh, child has clean teeth. That was some of the response to, 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 that, to that announcement. And actually, this is the latest edition of the British Dental Journal, and this is a dentist talking against supervised toothbrushing in schools, which kind of puzzles me as a public health and community dentist because, um, okay, it's not taxpayers' money, but we're quite happy to spend £50 million on removing uh, decayed teeth from children in England each year. Uh, the supervised toothbrushing scheme will cost a lot less than that. So for me, the economics don't quite add up in some of these uh, press um, art news articles. These figures actually date back to 2018. Um, these numbers are much higher now. So we are spending at least £2 million a year in Devon alone on uh, hospital GA for child tooth extraction. And it's the most common reason, uh, in fact, for children aged between five and nine to be admitted to hospital. And that's quite a staggering um, statistic and I think we all should be quite shame, sh shameful of. 1,750 GAs is actually over 2,000 now. In fact, in Plymouth, um, 2,000 teeth were taken out last year in Derriford Hospital. Uh, and that, that was probably um, partly a result of the COVID pandemic because the year before it was 4,000. So thousands and thousands of teeth are being extracted from children every single year. We know that supervised toothbrushing uh, has a good evidence base. It works. And we know that because there's a program in Scotland called Child Smile. Um, which is a national oral health improvement programme where supervised toothbrushing is the core component. And one of my colleagues shared this infographic with me. You can see the improvements that's made in Scottish children's oral health since that scheme has been in operation. We also know it's got a good return on investment. So we know it's clinically effective because we know fluoride toothpaste works because that research was done in the 1970s and we all use fluoride toothpaste ourselves. We know it's cost effective. Um, and we know there's good return on investment. So this was some modelling work done by Public Health England um, back in 2018. So for every pound spent, you um, achieve a three pound saving in terms of healthcare costs in other parts of the system. So we know it's a, a low cost, effective intervention, but sadly, it's not one we have a, a widespread across the UK. We've been a little bit involved in, in supervised toothbrushing, um, dating back almost to when I began in the dental school, in fact, I had a small grant when I first joined uh, of about £10,000 to develop supervised toothbrushing in some sure start centres as they were, were then. And students have been involved in this through their community outreach work. But all of this was quite precarious and the funding was not certain. So we were keen to see if we could develop um, a proposal to um, scale supervised toothbrushing, not just in Plymouth, but across Devon as a whole. So I have to give credit to Zoe, who was my trainee at the time. This is one of her trainee projects. And we did some work to look, at the, uh, to, to look at the costs for that in Devon. And this is the economic model. And you can see here that there's quite uh, uh, this arrow here at the 10 year point indicates uh, the return on investment, which was estimated to be 350,000 pounds. And I'm sure that'll be even greater now because this was work we did back in 2018. So even in Devon, we know that actually, if you can implement a supervised toothbrushing scheme, and it does have quite high upfront costs, but actually once you get over those mobilization costs and it becomes part of routine business, the cost savings are enormous to the healthcare system. And we wrote up a paper, we uh, thought we'd uh, found a really effective way of actually commissioning a program across multiple lo local authorities, which Devon has, it has three separate local authority areas. And that paper has been used quite a lot by colleagues in other parts of the country to help them mobilise supervised toothbrushing schemes as well. So what's the impact been? So um, we did manage to convince uh, the NHS locally to invest in a pilot scheme and that operated between 2019 and 2023. And that was uh, divided across three lots and the Dental School and PDSE bid uh, for two of those lots and we delivered the programme um, between those years. Uh, on average, about 6,500 children every single day brushing their teeth across Devon as a result of the programme. That number varies. I think in one year it was about 8,000. It just depends on um, engagement and, and enrolment of the schools. So in that time, over 25,000 children have benefited, 100,000 toothbrushes distributed. Again, we know that that in itself is a really effective and low cost intervention targeting uh, toothbrush impacts to uh, children in areas of high need. And 
Um, something that actually which most schemes around the country don't do, we also issued um, oral hygiene packs uh, throughout the school holidays um, so that children could continue brushing. And thinking about that dentist here who was talking about this, I don't think this dentist meets some of the families and some of the schools that I do when I'm out in the community because we know that there are many children who um, don't have a toothbrush or have to share a toothbrush with siblings. And in fact, I was out talking to a, I won't name the school because that would be unfair, but I was out talking to a head teacher recently in a quite a, a deprived part uh, of Plymouth. And she said it's even worse than toothbrushes. They have children who turn up at school with no underwear and they have to have, as well as jumpers and, and PE kit, they have to have a, a stash now of underwear and vests at school because children turn up without that. And I don't think sometimes people tend to see these things uh, in the way that we do if you work in the community. So a really good scheme and really important. So I'm going to uh, pivot now to adults and um, I'm going to cover this actually because this is one of the questions I was asked um, in the lead up to delivering this presentation and thinking about some of the challenges around providing support to adults with learning disability. There are around uh, 1,600 uh, adults registered uh, with a learning disability in Plymouth and actually they find it quite hard to access dental care for, for the obvious reasons you might ex expect and they often tend to have poorer oral health and when they do seek treatment, it tends to be more extreme. So rather than having a filling, they tend to uh, have an extraction or they tend to need a general anaesthetic. Most oral health promotion is directed to children, uh, quite rightly so, but that actually doesn't leave much activity available for adults. So there's no actual community prevention, there's no community support from dental teams or other public health practitioners for adults with a learning disability in the community. So again, this is something that grew out of student activity. So our students have been working with some of the disability support groups in, in the city for a long period of time. But we wanted to see if we could come up with an intervention that was much more sustainable. It was great the students did their work, but actually that was only for two terms of the year. What happens the rest of the year? So we came up with this idea of developing peer-led ambassador training. So we uh, developed a six weeks training program. We sought some volunteers from various uh, disability uh, support organisations and we trained uh, these individuals to be our ambassadors, our oral health champions in the local community and the idea was that we would train them and it was like an echo model so they would go out then in their communities and networks and groups and meetings and talk about oral health and we weren't quite sure if we were going to get any volunteers but actually we were inundated uh, with volunteers and this was the first cohort that we trained and we did this in partnership with our community engagement team and then uh, more lately with a, a local oral health charity and it was really successful. Um, it was successful on two levels, it was successful in, in terms of the, the programme was successful, we successfully trained the, the adults and they went out and did lots of training themselves and I think in the first year of this programme over 400 other adults with learning disability benefited from that oral health intervention but there are also lots of sort of uh, individual benefits as well. So um, this chap uh, never used to brush his own teeth and he was in his 40s. His parents still brushed his teeth for him because he just found it just too overwhelming. And at the end of the programme he was brushing his own teeth and his parents were delighted. Uh, there's another chap here who has type 2 diabetes and drank a lot of energy drinks and then following the programme he cut those totally out and we, uh, his GP was able to reduce his type 2 diabetic medication. So you have these lovely little impacts on the individuals concerned. Um, we actually graduated them, um, so they each got a certificate of participation of the programme. And this programme was sponsored by Dental Industry, again, a company called Henry Shire, who just thought it was absolutely brilliant and supported it for quite a, few, uh, a number of years. And again, talking, of, talking about impact, we did a really quite a simple evaluation just to show that it works. And we did a little bit of PR. Um, there was an, a news article in the BDJ, and we started getting contacted by people from ar around the country asking about the programme. Could we go and talk to them about it? Could we share um, how we, we did it? And we were invited to various dental schools around the country because uh, some of those dental schools wanted their students to be involved in something similar in their own communities. We were invited to various conferences. But probably the best impact was um, I was contacted by um, public, uh, the lead uh, nurse for learning disability in public health England and we were asked if we uh, would incorporate we were willing to incorporate into national guidance on oral health care for adults with learning disability and you can google this and find this online 
And there's a really nice video um, with one of our ambassadors talking about his experiences and what it meant to him and, and to his community. And it's really interesting, actually, it makes me smile because this individual, um, he didn't like talking in public, um, was very, very excruciatingly shy. And at the end of the programme, he, he, he wouldn't shut up. It was absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic. He was very happy to go out and talk about his experiences, present in front of other people. He presented in front of us. Um, it was absolutely wonderful to see his transformation throughout the programme. So that's uh, adults with learning disability. Um, one area we've done a lot of work on uh, at Plymouth is um, homelessness and oral health. And I'm sure you're aware, um, poor dental health is amongst one of the most common problems people experience in homelessness face. Uh, there was a, this survey was conducted in 2017 in London. Uh, you can see 60% of individuals who were experiencing homelessness had, it, had uh, experienced toothache since becoming homelessness, so, sorry, becoming homeless, and 15% have pulled out their own teeth, which is pretty shocking really for a, a, a modern society. And there's a little bit of a misconception here because uh, I started some work with homeless groups in, in Portsmouth and I had a real challenge actually convincing some of my colleagues to become involved in it because they felt that actually these, these people are not interested in their oral health, but that's just not the case at all. And that's certainly not been my experience. And you can see a lovely quote here at the bottom. The people they spoke to in that survey really wanted help to get their tea sorted, but they just didn't know how to do it. So we've done a huge amount of work uh, at, at Plymouth on, on um, homelessness, and Lindsay's been absolutely central to, to all of that. So um, again, a lot of this grew out of students and my very first project um, was working with some big issue vendors and the big issue team in Plymouth and we uh, provided some training to them on oral health. Uh, we tried to uh, organize some dental care for them with students that was sort of a bit, bit mixed in terms of success. And um, we did some work to promote oral health in the homeless population. So um, for a few years, we sponsored the tabards, the big issue uh, vendors were and we had this really nice slogan. I think it reads, oral health is a big issue, look after yours. And that was really nice. And every time I walked through uh, Plymouth, I, you know, people would shout out to me if I walked past them. Um, and it, it generated quite a lot of interest uh, in oral health. Were you involved in that one, Lindsay? No, no. <clears throat> so we've been involved in this sort of working in the community with homeless uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness. but. As much as that was great, they actually need access to dental care. So we had to find a way of actually establishing a service. So, and that's what we did. So um, back in 2018, we established a, a one day a week service in PDSE, the social enterprise arm of the school. And it was something we developed um, pro bono. So we didn't receive any funding for this. Um, we just felt it was the right thing to do. And it was initially, uh, uh, delivered by one of our graduate dentists who um, subsequently left and Elizabeth now is one of our other graduate dentists who's delivering this service and again I have to say thank you to Martha who's led a lot of the uh, research and evaluation of of this service. Um, it's been really hard to get it going and it's been really hard to maintain it and it's been really hard to secure funding for a service like this. Um, We've had to go through many years of actually developing the service and evaluating it before we had the evidence to present to the NHS to um, support services. One of the challenges is that services like this are always seen as quite expensive compared to general services. Um, uh, individuals who've had experienced homelessness, particularly at the extreme end, often have really high dental treatment needs. Uh, and those needs um, are, are quite complex and they're quite time consuming to, to, to treat. So we know um, through our own service, for example, that most patients take four or five hours of treatment to get to a point where they're dentally fit or dentally stable. And in the current NHS model, that just doesn't work for practices. It's not financially viable for, as a business. But I am pleased to say that over many years of, of, of trying and building up our evidence base, we have now got to a point where this service is commissioned by, um, by NHS Devon, and it's, it's fully integrated into the wider work and, in the city. Uh, to support people experiencing homelessness. So we work very closely with GP outreach service, with uh, residential centres, uh, community volunteers, a whole range of different people to make it work. And we also know that actually if you can provide dental care to people who are experiencing homelessness, it can be a real catalyst to change in their life. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that in, in a moment. 
So we've done quite a lot of work in this area. Um, so work to understand community needs so we could start to um, design the service. So we, we've taken very much a research informed approach to the care pathway. Um, again, working with the community to understand what they need and what they, and what they want. And we've done uh, an evaluation of the service. We've done various things. We've also done a bit of work talking out to the general public health community because um, we need them on our side as well if we're going to sustain and develop services for socially excluded groups. So how's it going? So um, since the service was developed, we've treated over 250 patients. We've got about another 40 in active care in Plymouth at the moment. We've got really high attendance rates. Our attendance rates are up in the high 70, early 80%. That's actually better than most of our routine clinics. So I think that's testament to the way the service has been developed and it's been developed with the community and with community support. Uh, we've got really positive clinical outcomes and I'll show a few of those pictures in a moment. So a health warning, there will be pictures of teeth coming up in a moment. Um, and we're just currently in the process of carrying out a, a cost effectiveness analysis. And that's been a really interesting piece of work because as I mentioned earlier, these services are more expensive, but we're trying to move away from talking about the price of the service and, the, and instead focusing on the value. And through that cost effectiveness analysis, we've been able to determine that for every pound spent, there's about four pounds saved in the, in the wider healthcare system. And that's pretty obvious if you think about the cost of an A&E visit, which is 419 pounds, or the cost of a GP visit, which is about 120. And if you don't have a dental service, that's where people go when they've got dental infection or, or pain. So it makes sense to the health system to invest in services like this. One of the reasons our service might be successful is because it's a dedicated one. And there's a real debate going on in, in, my, in my world um, regarding whether services should be dedicated or mainstream. Um, my view is that you probably need both, and that's what this nice guidance says. You need different types of model to cater for people at different stages of their journey. Um, but there is, a, there is an opinion out there that actually says that um, dental practice should be more inclusive for these groups. And that's a bit of a an academic debate going on in my specialty at the moment. My personal view is if you're working with people at the more extreme end of vulnerability, a dedicated service is the way to go because it has to have these certain design features in to make it successful. Because of the success of the service in Plymouth, we've been able very recently to expand. So we're now delivering a service in Exeter and you can see we've treated so far in a relatively short space of time 122 patients. And I know that, that those patient numbers don't seem particularly high, but like I said, you need to remember that these patients are very complex, complex socially and complex clinically and take a long time to treat and acclimatise to dental care. And as Ewan said, we've been very successful um, and we don't do it for awards, but this work has been recognised. We were very fortunate to win an NHS Parliamentary Award in 2020 for health inequalities for the service, which is great recognition for it. And I'm pleased to say that some of our work has been included in national reports on how uh, dental care should be designed for homeless populations. So what makes it work? So um, we've, been, uh, we've done a lot of evaluation work about the, the factors that, that influence success. And we've looked at that from both the perspective of the patients, the service itself, and also looking at, uh, at outcomes. And I was gonna read out sort of some of the key things from this slide, what makes it work, but actually they're all really important. Um, I think the service being integrated into the wider response to homelessness in the city really helps. Um, location helps, um, being free at the point of delivery. We don't charge our patients for access to this service because that's a fundamental barrier to accessing care. So a whole range of these things uh, matter. But I think the, the most important thing is that community engagement and outreach approach. Um, just establishing a service and expecting people to walk through the door does not happen with groups like this. So it needs much more community support, a community supported pathway. And we've been able to achieve that quite successfully. So this is my picture of teeth. So here are some examples of some of the dental treatment that we've delivered to some of our patients. And I do have consent for sharing these pictures. So you can see that actually it's quite transformative for the individuals concerned. And we know that when people are rehabilitated in this way, it can actually make such a difference to their confidence, their self-esteem, you know, just the ability to go and smile, to go to a job interview, to go to a, you know, an interview for, 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 a, for a house. It just makes such a, a significant difference to people's lives. And 
the two pictures on the left, these are two relatively young women. You know, they've got a whole lifetime ahead of them. You know, we need to make sure we get them dentally rehabilitated, ready for their, for their, for the next stage of their, of their life journeys. And I have to say thank you to the dentists who do this. It's not me doing this. This is our dental team who deliver this care. So you can see very, very important and very transformative. And we've used some of our learning to look at other high priority groups who find it difficult to access dental care. So uh, asylum seekers and refugees is another group. I don't know how familiar you are, but Plymouth is one of two receiving cities in the southwest for asylum seekers and refugees. So around 200 families arrive in Plymouth every year. Um, they may stay in Plymouth or they may be dispersed elsewhere after a short period of time. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, dental problems are uh, high on the list. Uh, about 40% of asylum seekers and refugees who arrive in Plymouth have dental problems and have a dental need that needs addressing and often can't find dental care uh, in order to um, treat those needs. We've done a lot of work again with students out in the community over the years. This is one of our students here delivering uh, some training to staff at the British Red Cross. But again, it was about access to dental care. Um, prevention and health promotion is, is, is really important, but if you've got a dental pain, that's not going to help you. You need access to care. And we've started to develop a, a dental service for asylum seekers and refugees called the Welcome Clinic in PDSE. It's still very early days, um, uh, stopped by COVID uh, again, like most things. So we're just starting to get going now. But what we're finding is that the communication and interpretation is a real challenge. Uh, quite challenging in, in many different ways, in fact. Um, NHS in, uh, the NHS has interpretation protocols, and even if you have a dentist who speaks the same language as the individual, they're not allowed to speak in that language unless they've done a 12-week course. And we've had some meetings about this with the Department of Health because it's just ridiculous. Um, if you speak English, you can speak to the patient in English, so why can't you speak to them if you speak the same language? But such is the NHS and that those are the rules. Um, so we we're working hard on this. It's difficult to provide care because interpretation takes so long and sometimes the uh, interpretation services that are provided by the NHS don't always match the languages of patients that we have. So it's logistically very challenging and um, but we're getting there and I'm hoping that we'll be able to present an evaluation of this fairly soon. So you mentioned um, I was very fortunate to be invited to attend the Senior Dental Leaders Programme at Harvard University in 2019, which was a fantastic experience. Um, I felt a little bit of imposter syndrome to begin with, because when I first walked into the room, most of the people were very important. Uh, there were chief dental officers from various countries of the world, uh, deans, executive deans of very large faculties uh, across the world, and, and there was me. Um, but. I was invited really because of the work that um, we've developed in, in Plymouth um, around community and also the concept of the social enterprise that, that you mentioned. So um, I had a great time on this course and I felt very lucky to be invited to attend it. And um, I met lots of really nice people. And I didn't realise at the time when I accepted the place on the course that there's, there's payback some years down the line. And that payback is helping some of the individuals who attend the course from uh, less well-developed countries in terms of dental education and service development. So um, there's a chap here called Emmanuel, is the chap here, who is the equivalent of Bob at a university in northern Ethiopia. And um, I, he asked if I could go over and help do some curriculum development in, in their school there. And just to warn you, there's quite a graphic picture in the next uh, s slide. So this is me in uh, Michaeli University in northern Ethiopia. So it's called Tigray province. It's a, an area of Ethiopia that borders um, Eritrea. And this is me outside the university. And this is where the medical and dental school are housed. And this is Emmanuel, who's the equivalent of Bob. And this is Malesi, who's the equivalent of Ewan. So Malesi is the head of school and he's a Maxvac surgeon, hence the gory picture. He invited me into surgery for a few days and I thought, mm, I haven't held a retractor for a long time, but yeah, let's do it. And it was really fascinating because I hadn't done surgery for a little while. And this actually is an ameloblastoma, which is a, a, quite a rare tumour. I've never seen one in my full practising career of 25 years, but actually there was about three or four on the list every single day in Ethiopia. And this is a tumour that you can see it had expanded into the uh, patient's right sinus. And you can see all the bone that's been eaten away by the tumour. 
Remarkably, um, they have to do a lot of their surgery by mobile phone light because the electricity supplies are so unreliable that the generators go. And this is uh, one of the uh, operating nurses holding a, an iPhone with the light on so he could complete the operation. It's absolutely fascinating. And it just makes you realize what some, what some people work in. And um, yeah. So that wasn't why I was there. I wasn't there for surgery. I was there for community. So my job was to try and convince Melesse to do more outreach work. So Melesse and I went around various places. This is an orphanage. There's lots of orphanages in, in Ethiopia. And I'm trying to get the students out into these orphanages. This is a blind school. So if children are blind in Ethiopia, they don't stay with their own families in the most case. In most cases, they have to board at a specialised um, blind school. So I managed to convince Melesse to get uh, students out doing some of the things that we do here in Plymouth, uh, out into local communities in, in Ethiopia. And that was going to be an ongoing relationship for me. But unfortunately, civil war broke out in Tigray province and the civil war uh, underway there even today. And I lost communication actually with Emmanuel and Melesse for a couple of years because they cut most of the communications to this part of, of Ethiopia. So that sort of stopped me in my tracks in that project. But the, the organiser of um, the Senior Dental Leaders Pro Programme phoned me up shortly afterwards and said, would you like, are you interested in doing another project in, in Africa? And me having difficulty saying no to most things, I said yes. So um, I've been involved in this project in Liberia for the past couple of years now. And uh, if you don't know where Liberia, if you don't know much about Liberia, it's this little country here in West Africa. Uh, it's the oldest African nation um, set up by... Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the African Resettlement Organization in the United States who decided to send people who had slave an ancestry back to Liberia uh, in the late 1800s. And they formed the, the state of Liberia, Liberation. Um, and they've still got quite strong cultural ties to the United States. It's a really poor country, even by uh, African standards. So I've, I've been lucky to travel to a lot of African countries and African universities and dental schools, um, this is just off the scale in terms of, of poverty. You can see some of the, some of the uh, statistics there. It's not had a lot of luck, Liberia. It's also been uh, subject to two uh, devastating civil wars. And it was the epicenter of the Ebola epidemic back in 2014 and 15. And it has the infamy, I guess, of being the only country in the world with no formal dental education. So they really are starting at rock bottom. Um, so that was a project I was asked if I wanted to be involved in. And I thought, crikey, where do I even begin? But luckily, um, there's a, there was an expat English dentist there called Simon, who's done a fantastic job. Um, he's one of those seven dentists, and there's also another expatriate dentist um, from Switzerland also there. And they've done a fantastic job at developing a, a dental centre. So this is the dental centre. It's called Trinity. It's based at the Elwa Hospital in Greater Monrovia. And this is Simon working in his surgery uh, with some locally trained uh, dental nurses. It's actually a pretty impressive dental clinic as, as, Af as, um, as Liberia goes. There is no other dental service apart from a max fax service at, at the public hospital in Monrovia. So the hospital in this is the only access to dental care that that 5.4 million population has access to in Liberia. So um, my role was to um, help support development of a, of a dental therapy school. And I was really, um, when I was sort of talking to Simon before my, my visit to Liberia, he was telling me about his local workforce. So all of these individuals have been trained informally by Simon. And I was a little bit sceptical to, sceptical to begin with. This is Archie and Morris, and they are exodontists. So, so people who take out teeth. And I thought, Mm, okay, interesting. What kind of training have they had? And he said, oh, I'll just train them on the job. And I was a little bit sceptical until I went into the surgery and saw them operate. And my God, we need to get them over training our students. They're absolutely unbelievable. So skilled and so competent at taking out teeth. But we wanted to formalise that and um, accredit them with the Liberian Medical and Dental Council. And some more gory pictures. So this is the need why we need to develop a workforce in Liberia. So you can see here, this is somebody with hyperdontia, too many teeth. And anyone want to take a guess at what that is? Yeah, so that's Noma. So that's a dental infection, uh, which has basically eaten its way through uh, the external flesh. 
very difficult to treat and many children die of noma in Africa because they don't receive treatment um, quickly enough. Because of the lack of healthcare services in Liberia, one of the things that most people turn to is witchcraft. So this patient here, you can see the swelling on the right hand side of his lower jaw. And you can see these chalky marks. That was um, a treatment administered by a witch doctor. And people have to pay to see the witch doctor. It's quite expensive. But of course, the treatment is totally ineffective. And then moving on, this is an oral cancer in a lady. And you can see this is a really common occurrence in the clinic in Liberia. So this is a severe dental infection, probably bordering on systemic involvement. And these patients have to be taken through next door to the hospital to have these incised and drained. While I was in Liberia, um, patients died pretty much daily from dental infection, which is quite kind of staggering, really. This is a small, this is a child. And uh, anyone want to guess what this is? Any dentists in the room want to take a guess? This is osteomyelitis, which is a severe bone infection resulting from uh, dental decay. It's almost unheard of in the, in the West. I've, I've never seen osteomyelitis in a child resulting from dental decay. And you can see when he had the teeth taken out, part of his alveolus was removed as well. So you can see that oral health, because it's neglected, has such a detrimental effect on the population. And bearing in mind, most of the population are very young. Most people get around in, in Liberia on mopeds or motorbikes, and this is somebody who fell off their, their, their motorbike or, or motorcycle. And you can see there's a fracture of the alveolus here. And uh, you can see how the teeth are elevated above the adjacent teeth. And this person, because he can't ask dental care, went to a, a doctor, and the doctor put this suture in. And as everyone, all the dentists and dental professionals in the room know, that suture is not going to do anything at all. Um, it's not even a very good suture, but let's not, let's not worry about that. So you can see there's just a really urgent need to develop dental workforce and dental skills and capacity in the city. And that's what I've been involved in in the last couple of years. So we've developed a two-year dental therapy practitioner program. We've um, worked with a, lo a local HEI, Cuttington University, to develop the program. It's been my job to help uh, write the curriculum, um, which is quite hard work at times, but we got there in the end. And we took our first cohort of students in in 2022. They're about to graduate this year. Um, I, really like to, I re would have really liked to go to the graduation ceremony, but I can't get there. And we've just taken on two further students as well. Sorry, another cohort of eight students in 2024. So we're developing this workforce in Liberia to address all of those um, issues. We're also working on the first oral health survey ever in the country in, co in partnership with King's College London. It's been a great project to be involved in, and this is the first cohort of students. Some of these were the locally, locally trained dentists who've been enrolled in the programme so we can formalise their qualification and their skills. So a great project. And my talk was called Making the Case for Oral Health. So this is me meeting some colleagues at Cottington University. This is the vice president of the university, a very impressive lady called Ramel, who did most of her academic training in the US. She actually worked for NASA for a little while. So an incredibly smart lady leading the university over there in Liberia. And this is us waiting to meet the Minister of Health. I didn't know this was going to happen when I travelled out. They had this itinerary for me when I arrived that we're meeting the Minister of Health, the Vice President and the Head of the Liberian Medical and Dental Council. And I didn't realise I was being used as a bit of a, of a, of a, a celebrity to get the project over the line because I came from the UK and we were willing to support the project educationally. So making the case for oral health, it's amazing what sometimes you can end up doing. So the idea is these, these graduates will go and work in the 15 counties of Liberia. At the moment, um, dentistry is only available in two of those 15 counties. So we've uh, specifically selected students from these towns and counties so they'll return there. And we're going to provide them with the equipment to provide very basic dental care, mostly extractions and simple fillings and scalings via a UK dental charity. So I just wanted to give you a sort of small flavour of some of the work that uh, I do um, internationally as well as, as well as locally, but all very much tied into community and dental education. So if you want to know more, um, we've got a web page. This is the Liberia Dental School web page. And I showed you the picture of the dental clinic earlier. This is the new dental therapy school that's been uh, built. So the dental therapy practitioners can be... Uh, their classrooms and all their teaching space will be in, in this building and this is the clinic.
they'll walk next door just to do their clinical practice. So, uh, Ewan's already mentioned this. So the community approach has been very successful at the dental school. So uh, I'll leave you with the, the comments or the, the feedback from the judges when uh, we won the Times Higher Education Award and you and Kathy went, went to collect the award. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. We've been pretty successful over the past decade or so, particularly in PDSE. We've won about 17 national awards and regional awards for the work that we do. And it's really hard developing a talk like this because there's so much I could include. So I've only been able to include some illustrative examples of some of the projects that we've developed in, in that time. And Ewan always tells me to finish on a funny slide. So I've got some thank yous and that's my funny slide, a starfish with some teeth. And those dentures were not made in, in the dental school, despite the rumours on social media. So thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for a fascinating talk. And the Gori slides uh, prepare as well for the canopies and drinks, which are going to be outside. But I'll take some questions from Slido, and then we can take some from uh, the audience here. So the first one, um, how do you see the development of dental services to hard-to-reach groups? You've kind of answered that in the presentation, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to comment, Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think I think some of the examples I, I presented in the slides are, are absolutely key. I think, um, firstly, there has to be prioritisation for those groups within the dental system, which currently doesn't exist. In fact, Martha and I were at a, a, a regional NHS meeting on Monday presenting some of our research findings on homelessness and oral health, and um, it transpired that we were the only service in the entire South West providing care for these groups. So, um, yeah, prioritising investment. Uh, you have to want to address oral health inequalities. And I think at the moment, most commissioning strategy and Department of Health strategy is based on general access and improving access for, for um, the majority of the population. And unfortunately, those groups that do suffer from oral health inequalities tend to be deprioritised. Okay, a more fun one. Skydiving in Cyprus, yomping with squaddies and patrol because it's an interesting thing to do. How does being a professor compare? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's different. Um, but I think those experiences, I think, will really lend themselves to working in an environment like um, the one that we work in. Um, although, the thought of going back to Cyprus and doing some skydiving and diving does sound very appealing. Thank you. Any questions here? I can... Thanks very much, Rob. That was a uh, fascinating and still trying to do, you know, disseminate all that work you're doing. And congratulations on it. My my interest, obviously, is a thing called rural. Mm -hmm. And I noticed just in one of your slides you had that, and that was in Liberia. So what are you? What's happening in rural communities in the United Kingdom? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. When you look at dental, dental access across the, the country, it's the rural areas that are described as dental deserts. So the, the uh, three areas that are always mentioned in, in the news and in policy reports are Cornwall, Cumbria and East Anglia. And it's a really difficult um, challenge. Um, I think the reasons are multifactorial. Um, I don't understand why people wouldn't want to work in the southwest or Cornwall, but unfortunately people don't. And I think... Um, I think the dental school is starting to address that. I think having a dental school here is really beneficial. It draws down uh, uh, professionals, dental academics, dental professionals who want to work and be associated with a dental school. I think that's part, part of the answer. I know in Cumbria, they've tried to incentivize service delivery by offering financial incentives. There's kind of been mixed results with those. So they offer golden hellos or um, salary enhancements or training opportunities. Um, a mix, a mixed picture. Um, yeah, you could talk about that all evening, to be honest, Ian. It's a, it's a real, real challenge. I mean, I think one of the problems that we face in the southwest is that we're trying to play catch up all the time. So the southwest is relatively underdeveloped for dental services, and it has been for a long period of time. So we're so much further behind the start, the start line, and I think it's going to take a generation to actually try to improve that. But unless we can recruit and retain, you know. The, the superstars of the future in the southwest. We're never going to change that, I don't think. I think uh, I 
kind of follow on from that. Uh, when I came in this evening, I had a beautifully crafted question for the entire audience to enjoy. Uh, but halfway through the lecture, I decided to go private. And so you'll have to pay me to hear it. Discuss. I don't know where to start with that one, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you, I mean, I presume you're referring to the lack of NHS dental access in the, in the southwest. It sort of refers back to the point I was making to Ian. Um, I mean, rural areas and, and remote areas are hardest hit by um, lack of access. And, and again, it's, it's multifactorial. It's, it's, it's down to so many different reasons. If you speak to many of the local dentists in the region, and there's some dentists in the room here, one thing that works against dentistry in particular is the existing NHS dental contract, um, which is um, widely discredited by the profession. Um, it was introduced in 2006, and up until very recently, there's been very few changes made to that contract. So while healthcare has moved on in that time, since 2006, the dental contract hasn't. And it's, it's quite a difficult um, thing to discuss because um, when it's discussed in the media and the press, it's often, um, it's often pitched at, at blaming dentists, you know, dentists choosing to go private. Um, but I think the reality is that most dentists don't want, well, most dentists would like to offer some NHS care but actually it's the private part of their business that subsidise the NHS. Most NHS dentists will tell you it's actually a lost leader now to provide NHS dental care. So it just comes down to market forces and, and business viability. But there are probably people better in the room than me to describe that. So I don't know if that's answered your question. I, I, I wish I could magic up some more NHS dentists, but it's, um, it's challenging. You know, it's something that we are pressured on a little bit in the dental school. Why don't we, you know, um, some of our students stay in the region, but many move out of the region. What, why is that? And I think it's quite kind of multifactorial. I'm not a dentist, and I only know dentistry from being somebody who takes advantage of it from time to time. But I'm aware of problems there are with the national G, with the GP um, mm -hmm. situation, where people don't really want to take on the responsibility of um, being a GP and running their own practice or being in a team and so prefer to be locums. Are you finding that sort of thing in the dental industry as well? And the other thing I wanted to ask you was, what sort of person becomes a dentist? Because I know I thought about it when I was leaving school, but I didn't fancy the lifestyle, I'm afraid, and did something completely different. Um, is it people coming through with a sense of vocation or, you know, why, why would you choose to be a dentist? I do think that what you've spoken about today actually makes it a lot more interesting than I was aware of when I was a young person. But I'd be interested to know just a bit more about who is a dentist and how do they fit that in with their lifestyle and women having a family and things. It's, there's a lot of complexities in there. Mm -hmm. Amy, if I address your first point, um, I think that's a, really, that's a really good point, actually. That feeds into the question from the gentleman there. I think um, younger dentists, dentists that we train, um, see owning a business as being less desirable. And um, there have been some workforce surveys carried out by uh, Health Education England that indicate that most dentists would like a portfolio career. So working in practice perhaps a couple of days, working in a dental school, maybe doing something completely different the remainder of the week. And that's definitely a sea change from when I graduated. Most people went into practice and ended up owning a practice. But I think the business pressures that come from owning a dental practice are quite high. We've probably got some practice owners in the room who can probably speak from a better position than I can. Um, I, think what, I think what most people felt don't realise is that running a dental practice is, is a business. It's health and business combined. It's slightly different to medicine in that respect. I know GPs run their practices, but um, the way the dental contract works, it's based around activity. So the dentist only gets paid for delivering dental care. And that creates like a treadmill effect. And um, as I mentioned, the dental contract is, it has problems. It's not really been um, uh, revised or reformed 
for a long period of time and it's become obsolete really as a, as a workable contract. But there's some dentists in the room who probably own practices and run them. Would anyone like to come in? No. <laughs> uh, we, Rob, we'll take one more question and then we'll call it a day there because we could go on quite a while, I'm sure. So. Um, I'm going to ask a completely non-NHS <laughs> question. Um, I'm curious. You spoke about uh, the commonalities of dental disease and other systemic illnesses um, and obviously about a lot of the programs that are done. Are there any programs where there's a combination of, um, say, I mean, like when I was in Barbados, I, I, we did a training for diabetic uh, community educators so that they were going out to, to talk about diabetes, but they were also talking about dental health. I don't know if you've ever done anything, because I think sometimes, you know, it, it, it's you, you can kind of join forces instead of <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. doing separate things. I don't know if you've ever done that or if you've ever seen any success doing that. Yeah, that's a really good question, Safia. So, yeah, I, I think there are. Um, so we always try to work through that common risk factor approach. So um, part of the education, training and development of the wider education, health and social care workforce is around that very principle. So, um, you know, making every contact count, as you may have heard of. Um, so it's when you have those conversations at that individual patient level, um, you know, just like dentists talk about smoking cessation and safe alcohol consumption, other healthcare professionals, we, sorry, we need other healthcare professionals to talk about oral health and the importance of oral health. I know there was a program actually in might know of this, um, I think it was in the Midlands whereby um, at the point of dementia diagnosis, uh, the individuals were referred for a dental assessment. And I think until we start getting to those sort of integrated care pathways, working with other healthcare professionals, uh, oral health will always be a silo. And it's almost that case now. So dentistry has become disenfranchised from the wider NHS. And I think we need to work on more integrated care pathways. And I'm sure you know Zoe's leading a project on blood pressure screening in the dental setting. Um, and I think, I think there's a huge potential there and um, certainly something I would support. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we'll draw things to a close. Thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you to everyone online, where the majority of the audience are. And thank you very much indeed to Professor Witten for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>